So thank you for joining us today. Um, most of you already know the Breathing City Network, but we are uh, a group of academics and health professionals looking at both indoor and outdoor air quality. Um, and today we host a lot of seminars, as you probably know, and today we have a speaker who's joining us from the University of York. And Sarah West is uh, the Centre Director of the Stockholm Environment Institute at York, and she took that role in March 2020. But she's got over 10 years of experience in doing citizen science on a variety of different um, research fields and research areas. Um, but more recently, she's been applying it to air quality, which is why I've invited her here today. Um, so she'll be mainly talking about air quality, citizen science, but I imagine she'll probably mention a few other projects as well um, during her talk. So I'll hand over to Sarah now if you want to share your screen. Um, and yeah, I'll pop mute, but I will be here. Fabulous, thank you. Let me just pop that on then. All right, I hope you can see that okay. Um, it's lovely to be here today. Thank you so much for inviting me along. Um, so as Helen said, um, I'm at the Stockholm Environment Institute at the University of York, and I'm just going to show you some slides to show you what SEI is all about in case you don't, you're not aware of us. So um, SEI has got um, offices all around the world um, and our mission is to support decision making and induce change towards sustainable development. And we do that by providing integrative knowledge that bridges science, policy and practice in the fields of environment and development. And I am from our York office, as Helen said. So I started at SEI in 2008. And I've been working exclusively on citizen science projects since then on a whole range of topics. Um, and in March 2020, I took over centre director and then we immediately closed the office because of um, COVID. Um, but I just wanted to show you some of the areas that we're working on. So we've got researchers, we've got 45 members of staff um, and we've got about 15, 20 PhD students. Um, and um, we're working in these kind of five areas. So air quality, climate and environmental change, citizen science, critical environmental governance, environments, human health and well-being, and sustainable consumption and production. And so I'm going to talk about the projects that are kind of at the intersection between citizen science and air quality today. So what is citizen science? I thought I'd start off with a definition because um, lots of people have different perceptions of what citizen science is. And so this is the definition that me and my team work with. Um, so citizen science projects are those in which those where volunteers work with scientists to answer real world scientific questions. Um, volunteers can be involved at all stages of the scientific process. So from suggesting hypotheses, um, suggesting topics to focus on, deciding which projects can be funded, um, through to collecting data. Um, this is a really common parts of citizen science projects is that people are involved in data collection um, or people could be involved in inputting data. Uh, they can also be involved in data analysis, so downloading data perhaps and using it for their own purposes or downloading it and um, analysing it for scientists. Um, can be involved in the report or paper writing either as sole authors or as co-authors with um, professional scientists and then um, disseminating findings um, for example via social media using creative methods which I'll talk about later um, and uh, word of mouth um, is another really important way of dissemination. So projects that just have people involved in collecting data. So as a researcher, you've already decided that you're going to monitor air quality in people's homes, for example, you've decided the um, equipment that you're going to use, and you're basically just giving people the monitor and asking them to go and collect data for you. Um, those types of projects are called contributory citizen science projects. Citizen science projects where people can be involved in all stages of scientific process from deciding what questions are going to be researched right through to disseminating the findings. These are called co-created projects and a project that I've been involved with, which is a really nice example of co-created project, is Parenting Science Gang. So that was funded by the Wellcome Trust and they basically gave... Um, Sophia Collins, who's a, a public engagement practitioner, um, some money and said, you can work with parents on whatever you want to work with them on. And so parents, um, and it was 95% of our participants were mothers. Um, 
they decided to do things about um, the nutritional value of breast milk, about how hot babies get in slings and about fussy eating and a whole range of other topics. So that's a really nice co-created project that you can have a look at um, if you're interested. Uh, projects that are collaborative tend to involve people in um, less, fewer stages than co-created projects, but still span a large number of those um, projects. So these is, might be you've already decided that you're going to do a project on air quality in homes, but you haven't decided exactly how you're going to do it, which groups to target, what numbers of people are going to be involved, what equipment you're going to use, etc. And that you also want to have some participation in terms of um, dissemination and things. So that's where you would choose a collaborative approach to your project. So I'm just going to talk through now some of the benefits um, of participating or of running projects in a citizen science approach. So it's one way of engaging the public. It's a dreadful term and you really never want to think about people as such a broad audience, but um, it's, I'm using it in shorthand here. So it's one way of engaging people in scientific research. It can allow you to tackle research questions that require large amounts of data. Um, over large areas or large numbers of data collectors. Um, if it's a really complex issue, such as air quality, um, you can often benefit by having diverse participants um, because when you get diverse groups of people together, you tend to come up with creative solutions to issues. And another really important element is that you can have educational benefits. So, for example, you can raise people's scientific literacy or knowledge of um, this topic or um, increase um, connections between community members, et cetera, through interactions with scientists. And it can be a really, really useful way of raising awareness of the topic. Um, I'm just gonna thank my colleague for um, helping me prepare this slide. Rachel Pateman works with me at, at the University of York. Um, so the types of impacts that we expect from citizen science project ultimately are um, potentially improved well-being of our participants and environmental change. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk through some of the pathways to having this impact. Um, so there can be real benefits for science and decision-making. So through a citizen science approach, you can, you, you can get more and or better quality data. You can also get then outcomes from that are research publications or environmental understanding. There are also benefits for participants. Um, so social and nature engagement. So if your project is involving doing stuff um, actually out in the environment, people are spending time outdoors, people might gain a sense of place, they can meet new people. Um, they also gain potentially knowledge and skills relating to the topic, gaining scientific literacy or critical thinking skills. And then the second order outcomes relating to that can be things like reduction in stress, new relationships and communities form, change in values and um, perspectives, people increase their employability, etc. And then you also have benefits that are kind of for both parties, I guess. Um, so people, if you have close working relationships between your participants and the scientists, um, people can get an understanding of how science is relevant to their lives. Local knowledge can be incorporated into the scientific process and scientists can be more open to, to um, research questions that are actually of relevance to the public. Um, and that can create more locally relevant and democratic science and also increase trust um, in science um, and its outcomes. And this can lead to outcomes relating to scientific advances, policy or decision making change, local environmental change and citizen behaviour change. So hopefully you can see that there's potential for these impacts um, as a result of projects. But there's always a but. There are potential issues um, with this approach. So particularly this is problematic for projects that require um, some kind of digital interaction. So that might be via a web app or um, a native app, or it could be, for example, um, by a piece of technology. And I think we tend to expect that everybody has a smartphone that um, can access these, these kinds of things and that everyone has literacy relating to digital technologies, but there is a digital divide, um, even in countries like the UK. Um, so that's something to be aware of. 
There can also be trade-offs between the scale of the project and the quality of engagement. So if you're doing a project with, say, 40 participants, you can have really in-depth relationships with those people. You can find, provide a very kind of bespoke interaction with them. You can tailor the project very much to their needs. If you're doing a project with 3,000 schools, for example, it's going to be a very different relationship um, and um, a, a different quality or depth of engagement. Um, I talked through the impact, um, pathways to impact on my last slide. It can be really hard to demonstrate that you've had an impact um, on participants. Um, and particularly if you are having to do robust evaluation for your projects, um, that can be time consuming for participants um, and annoying. You know, if they're spending all this time working on projects with you and then you ask them to fill in an evaluation form that can be, um, that can set up some une unequal power dynamics. Um, and can also um, just be time consuming. Um, you need to have really robust procedures in place for ensuring high quality data. So that might be like checking a sample of, um, of readings as you get them in, for example. Um, and you also need to be able to statistically handle uneven sampling that might take place um, from your project. Um, and it can also be hard to incorporate this kind of data um, that you get from citizen science projects into official reporting channels, for example, for their sustainable development goals. And another really big issue, which I could spend a whole seminar talking about, but I'm not going to now, is about lack of diversity in participants. So citizen science is often sort of touted as a democratising movement, a way of getting new voices into science, but it's really, really hard um, to engage certain sectors of society and it requires deep trusting relationships to start to work with organisations who can act as gatekeepers into particular elements of um, society. Um, and so I think people kind of think, well, I'll just design a project and people will come to it. But if, if you just if you just kind of don't make an effort to reach out um, to different participants, effectively you're going to get um, middle to upper class white predominantly men participating in your projects. Um, so that can be that can be an issue. Um, I'm going to talk now about citizen science air pollution projects and I'm going to run through um, some that I have been involved with but there are many 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 citizen science air pollution projects out there um, and I think this is partly because of the rise in low cost sensors um, and also increased public awareness of issues of air quality. Um, projects um, use either fixed or mobile monitoring and can be indoor or outdoor. So I've got, I think, four that I'm going to run through, but hopefully that will leave us some time for questions about them at the end. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about was um, a project that I led um, about four years ago now um, called the Air Network. And Air stood for Action for Interdisciplinary Air Pollution Research. Um, and um, it was funded by the Medical Research Council and the Arts and Humanities Research Council through GCRF, which is sadly not really much of a funding stream anymore, but it was a really lovely, really nice um, project. Um, and it was co-led by um, my colleague Heather Price um, and Patrick Booker, who was formerly at SEI York. Um, so this project was focusing on Makuru informal settlement, um, which is in Nairobi. Um, so why did we decide to focus on Makuru? Well, um, so SEI um, has an office in Nairobi, SEI Africa is housed in um, Nairobi and community members um, approached SEI Africa about seven years ago now and said, look, we think we might have an issue with um, like smoke, air pollution is, is, we think there might be an issue. Um, could you do something about it? And so we did a little pilot project funded by SEI um, where we used, um, die loss monitors on backpacks um, in the community um, and kind of demonstrated that there was a real thirst for knowledge um, about air quality in the region, in the community. Um, and then that led on to various funding bids and eventually we got funded through this um, GCRF work. Um, and we decided to focus on this area because there's this really huge number of premature deaths per year in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and issues with um, obviously impacting people's resilience, productivity and well-being. So we had a kind of a reason for doing the research. We wanted to find out more about um, the air quality issue in the area and also was kind of community demand 
for it. So our approach was to um, build an understanding of community experiences of air pollution in Makuru. And we used a transdisciplinary research approach. So um, trans, we use the term transdisciplinary to mean that it involves different discipline, academic disciplines and really importantly, community members. So that's where the kind of transdisciplinary bit comes in rather than interdisciplinary. And we use creative participatory methods. So comics, for example, here's an example of a comic um, and that you can actually see that was part of the bid. Um, so we were doing things like, we were using methods like street games, theatre um, and photography. Um, so we spent a lot of time building a collaborative research team um, in Makuru. So we went and had, um, we ate together, which was really important for kind of bringing people together and developing soft ties. We did yoga together, um, which was just a really lovely experience um, and kind of, yeah, gave us kind of talking points. Um, we did, we played um, kind of warm up games, um, which is a black and white photo. And then we, we also had a, a kind of a tour of the settlement. So people, so informal settlement residents who were our participants in the workshop um, took us around the informal settlement and showed us the kind of key places that they thought um, might be causing air pollution. We also co-designed um, a kind of, a, a con well, not really a co contract, but a kind of an agreement for ways of working, um, which kind of, outlined some of the personal attributes that we thought it would be important to have as team members. Um, so we all developed these in little kind of breakout groups. We had about four groups um, working on this and you can see one of the groups here. Um, and then we brought all of those things together in the meeting, typed, uh, wrote it up on a screen and then later uh, on a flip chart and then later typed it up. Um, and these include some of the attributes such as being a risk taker and reaching out to people and um, being reliable, being responsive, being flexible, those kind of things. And the idea was, was that if we had issues down the line, we could say to people, well, hang on, we've all agreed that we're signing up for this. Um, and, and we actually got people to physically sign this um, at the meeting, um, which I would really recommend um, if you are doing this very kind of co-created project with um, participants. Um, so I just wanted to show you kind of what some of the activities that we did within the project. So this project didn't actually do any air quality monitoring. We were just exploring people's perceptions of air quality because others have been doing air quality monitoring um, um, before and since. Um, so what we did, so we had these four kind of mini projects. Um, so one was just kind of raising awareness of the issue. And so we did um, interviews with participants. We did some photographs of sources, created a digital story and made a hip hop track. Um, then we had another one, which was um, actually kind of uh, working with schools um, and making murals and exploring kind of what actions people could take to um, combat air pollution. Um, and because we had a mix of researchers from different backgrounds, we had air pollution researchers, as well as theatre practitioners, as well as um, storytelling experts. And we were able to kind of merge all these methods together. Um, we did some work where we were mapping the policy landscape and then we invited key policymakers to a meeting um, which um, brought together um, policymakers in the region, plus also um, community members. And we actually performed a theatre piece called Legislative Theatre, which is where audience members come in from, after they've, they've watched the piece, they come in and take the role of different actors in the piece to try and make, um, fix, uh, fix the issue. So the issue that we were talking about in this piece was about um, uh, exposure um, to, um, dusts at work um, and we got theatre, uh, we got policymakers to step in and play the roles of either the worker or the manager um, and basically they tried to um, develop a positive outcome to the end of the story and the other actors in the piece who are all community members um, kind of push back and say well we can't do that because of x y and z and then the, the policymaker sees that actually some of the policies they want to implement are not as simple as they expect them to be. 
Um, and then all of these kind of work packages fed through into um, uh, hood, this Hood to Hood event, which was basically a huge um, celebration in the football grounds of the informal settlement. We had about 1500 people attend. Um, we had two um, music tracks that we wrote as part of the project. Um, and those were played and we had games and it was all about raising awareness and celebrating um, the project. So our key findings from this project were that um, residents and researchers had very different ideas of what air pollution was. So community perceptions of air pollution were much broader um, than um, sort of the researcher, the air pollution researchers um, conceptions of air pollution. Um, smell was really, really important for community members. Um, Things like, for example, cleanliness in the house um, was thought to be air pollution. Um, people came up with um, solutions to air pollution that were very varied and very well grounded in the local context. Um, and there was this real feeling that air pollution couldn't be viewed in isolation from other community issues. Um, and the creative methods that we use, so such as theatre, um, gave a really broad entry point for discussing um, these issues. So an example of this is that um, one of the events that community members talked about while we were preparing the theatre piece um, was um, a big fire broken out in the settlement. And obviously they know that kind of smoke and the smell, this is pollution entering the air. Why was the fire starting in the first place well because of overcrowding and lots of burnable material so the houses you can just see in this top picture here um the houses are about three by three meters um and don't have any windows and um, they've just got one kind of living space in them um largely made of um of tin or um tin and wood um and the other problem was, was that not only did you have this kind of very flammable environment you also had very poor water provision um, so it's, it was really difficult to get water in to actually put the fire out and because the roads are all unpaved you can't get fire engines in to put out quickly. So very quickly we, we stopped talking about air pollution, started talking about far broader issues which was really valuable. Um, and, and we just found that kind of projects like this are a really good way of bringing together multiple stakeholders, so community members, teachers, and policymakers and researchers all in together. So that project led really nicely onto another project, which is also in the same settlement um, and a neighbouring settlement. So this is also in Makuru. This project's still going on. We've had major delays due to COVID. Um, so this is funded by the Medical Research Council um, and it's led by the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and KEMRI, which is the Kenyan Medical Research Institute. Um, Kenya uh, National Research Foundation also gave us a little bit of money and so did Welcome for some dissemination. So this project directly built on the air network, the previous project that I mentioned, um, and was really, really useful um, when we were writing the bid to be able to go back to some of our community participants from the air network and say that we're thinking of doing this, do you think that will work? Um, and some of the ideas that they came up with were really important. So, for example, we've said, oh, we're probably going to do a questionnaire as part of this study. And um, what sort of questions do you think we should consider? And somebody said, oh, um, will you ask the children about glue sniffing? And we thought, well, we hadn't planned on asking the children about glue sniffing. Do you think we should? And they said, yeah, it's like a really prevalent pastime for young adults. And I guess that could potentially affect their lungs, so you should probably ask them about it. Um, so we've ended up doing um, spirometry and air pollution measurements um, in these two communities. So Buruburu is a wealthy community and Makuru is a less is the is the informal settlement. Um, and we've had um, 1600 um, children participate in the project to varying degrees. Um, we've done walking interviews. Um, which is where um, the, uh, so this was with 14 plus year olds and they were asked to take us to somewhere where they felt they could breathe easily and somewhere where they felt they could, they found it harder to breathe. And we walked with them, we videoed it on a GoPro as we were going along um, and asked them questions about what they could see and the environment that they were in um, to get an understanding of whether their perceptions um, were different between the two communities and what they were exposed to. 
Um, we also did storytelling. So we got um, children, uh, 500 children from, I can't remember how many schools, maybe 20 different schools, um, to draw us pictures of um, what they thought, what, what they thought of when they heard the words air pollution. And then we did these focus groups with them where, with, where we actually asked them to do some analysis of those drawings from their class, which meant that we've got codes um, we could theme people's responses directly based on the children's own um, codes, their own their own themes, um, which was really magical. Um, we use a lot of um, creative methods again for engagement. Um, so here's a little picture of um, a puppet show. This is called Billy's Day Out, um, and this is one of the Kenry researchers um, showing the, the the this is meant to be a puppet of a child what it is that they're going to be talking about and how they're going to be breathing into the spirometer and that they're going to do a run and things like that. Um, so that was a really useful way of building um, kind of um, awareness of what was going to happen. So sensitization is, is the kind of the term they use locally for this um, sort of awareness raising of a project, kind of warming people up ready to participate in the project. Um, and this approach, which was done by largely by um, community researchers who'd been involved in the Air Network project, um, this sensitization was absolutely critical for engaging those really large number of school children and their parents um, and they we're just writing up the findings at the moment um, and they the team will help disseminate those findings um, so they did murals for example um, they had um, uh, like a banner thing that they walked through the streets um, to raise awareness they had a song um, I've put lots of links in um, for you to have a look at, at the end if you want to um, so that's all I wanted to say about um, Tupamui. Um, so now I'm going to move on to talking about SAMI, which is a new project. It's a UK based project and it's led by a couple of people who are, I know, well known to the Breathing Cities team. Um, so this is funded by EPSRC and the Department for Education and it's led by Henry and Paul. Um, so we are investigating if we can monitor schools air quality at a national scale um, with two to three thousand monitors and at relatively low cost whilst engaging schools through a citizen science approach. So this builds on the CoTrace project if you're aware of that one um, but it's brought um, SEI York into it because of our um, citizen science experience. So we're leading on the schools engagement um, which includes co-designing the project and its web app. Um, and the web app is absolutely critical for giving contextual information about where these monitors are. So people are getting an air gradient monitor, which measures temperature, relative humidity, vo total vox, um, PM and um, CO2. Um, but I mean, we could just send these, these monitors out to schools, a bit like the DfE did with their CO2 monitors. But we would have no information about where those monitors were, what was happening in the classrooms, etc. So we're designing this web app, which will prompt um, pupils to actually tell us something about where their monitor is. So what is the approximate size of the classroom? Approximately how many pupils does it have in it? And then be prompting them to do little activities like, um, is the window open? Can you open the window? What happens to some of the numbers on the, on the monitor? Um, and we think this is critical for not only having that contextual information, but also for encouraging them to come back, keep coming back to um, the monitor and to the um, web app to keep learning about um, air quality. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just going to go back one. Um, so the other thing I wanted to say about the SAMI project is that we're um, co-designing it, as I said, with schools. So. Um, my colleague Lucy Way and I are organising these co-design sessions with schools. So we're doing uh, 30 to 40 minute sessions with three um, audiences at the moment this term. Um, so we're working with teachers from primary and secondary schools um, to get their perspectives on do they need it to be curriculum linked um, resources? The answer is in an ideal world, they wouldn't like to have to worry about the curriculum. But yes, they do need it to be curriculum linked if they're going to have ongoing engagement. Um, and to also get their perspectives on how easy it's going to be to set up um, uh, with Wi-Fi access, access to tablets, those kind of things. 
Um, the second audience that we are doing focus groups with is pupils themselves, so often with a teacher, um, always with a teacher actually, um, and um, so we're asking pupils about things like what activities they'd like to see in the app, whether they like different logo designs better or worse, um, and um, getting ideas from them about websites that they like using at school, which will help us to inform the design of our web app. And then a third group that we're doing focus groups with is Arkwright Scholars. So Arkwright Scholars are young people aged, I believe, 16 to 21, who are um, given a scholarship from the Small Peace Trust. And the Small Peace Trust is a charity that are trying to get uh, more diverse young people into engineering. And so they have these um, scholars program who are kind of attached to a, they're, they're kind of situated within a school um, and they do things like a science club or activities with certain year groups and so they're a really useful older audience um, for us um, so we're getting their input into the into the web app design as well um, so the last project I wanted to talk about before we go to questions is um, a project called Ingenious um, which I don't quite know how this acronym stands for this but it stands for understanding the sources transformations and fates of indoor air pollutants um, and it's um, one of the SPF clean air program projects led by um, Professor Nick Castle at the University of York and we are working with Bradford with the Born in Bradford cohort study um, so Bradford's been chosen because it has a high ethnic diversity and it also has um, quite high uh, we think quite high um, levels of air pollution because it's high levels of deprivation. Um, so we're working with households to understand how certain behaviours affect sources of air pollution and their exposure to that air, um, that air pollution. Um, and so my role is to help support the co-production and evaluation of behaviour change interventions. So Chantal Wood, who is at the University of Sheffield, is leading this work on um, behaviour change. Um, so I'm kind of supporting with that. The other thing that we're doing at SEI is we're going to be um, supporting the development of policy recommendations. Um, which have kind of will be designed with community members, local authorities, planners, developers, um, industry representatives, etc. via what we're calling an impact panel. So this is a, a kind of a panel of people that meets um, virtually two or three times a year um, to discuss project out how the project is going basically project design um, and to help us have impact um, from the work so let us know about key mechanisms that we can use for dissemination if there's key policies coming up that we need to know about that we could feed into to help influence etc um, so we had our first meeting in may i think and i think our second one is in september um, so it's 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 been really useful so far for getting input into the project at this kind of early stage because it only started about a year ago um, and I think it will be really useful um, if we want to have policy impact our kind of experience at SEI suggests that bringing policy makers into the process really early on is really helpful for maximizing the chances of having that impact so that's why we set up the panel the way we have so that's all I had to say in terms of presentations. I realise I've run through four projects quite quickly, um, but I wanted to give you an overview of the types of things that I've been doing so that you could ask any questions that you have um, about the work or about citizen science more generally. Um, I would recommend having a check out of some of these um, links. Um, so the first one is talking about the um, air network. Um, if you follow the Tupamuwe link, um, you'll see some of the, um, the work that we're doing on that. And then there's also some information um, on Ingenious um, there at the bottom. So thank you for listening. There's my contact details if you want to follow up anything um, outside of this session. But otherwise, I look forward to a discussion with you about citizen science and air pollution. Thank you, Sarah. That was, that was really interesting. Um, I've put a comment in the chat for people if they can, you can either put your questions in the chat box there or you can just raise your hand or unmute um, and ask them. But I'll start us off by, uh, I mean, we discussed this a bit when I saw you the other month, but I was really interested when you have all these children involved in these studies, there must be quite a lot of paperwork involved in the consent for these and the data protection and how do you mm. around that or is that a kind of, is there a standard way for citizen science projects to deal with that? 
Oh, yeah, that is such a great question, Helen. And um, so I'm on another project at the moment that is funded by UKRI, and it's just funding citizen science projects in the food health space. Um, and it's really interesting. Food, food health space, is that what I mean? Food, safe, food safety and food health space um, and we had a session last week um, which brought all of the different projects together to learn and everybody was complaining about the ethics processes with citizen science projects so I think these the kind of short answer is every organization handles it differently um, we at York because we've been doing citizen science projects in SEI York since 2008 they're well our ethics panel are well used to dealing with them so for Parenting Science Gang, for example, what we did was we put an initial application saying, we're going to be working with estimated this number of parents using Facebook. This is how we're going to recruit them. This is how we're going to handle their data, etc. But we don't know what we're going to do yet. And at the point when we do know what we're going to do, we will put in a revised ethics application. So, I mean, our poor ethics panel for that project, because it ran over two years and had 12 different projects I think we had 12 amendments to that ethics application <laughs> um so yeah shout out to our um, ethics people at York for that um whereas I think other other organizations find it much more hard to, to deal with these kind of things because they're not used to them and I think particularly if you're an institution where your ethics board maybe meets once a term and you have to provide materials a month in, in advance of the meeting and you've got one shot and that's it, basically. I think it can be really challenging with co-created citizen science projects. Um, in terms of kind of safeguarding and things like that, so um, so the team at York, we all got enhanced um, DBS checks, disclosure borrowing services checks, which meant that if we did want to go and run focus groups in schools, we would, you know, that would kind of tick that box. Um, and I think it's just a case of thinking when you're doing the ethics process, just thinking very carefully about well, data protection about who needs to have what information. I mean, if you're going to do um, um, analysis uh, with your participants, then that's that can be very challenging in terms of thinking, well, who needs to have the data and do they need to have all of the data or can they have anonymized data? At what point do you need to anonymize is quite important. Um, but I do think that talking to participants about the ethics process can actually be quite helpful too. So they kind of understand what the purpose of them is. Um, the other kind of ethics, ethics pitfall um, I was going to flag has just gone out of my head. Never mind, it might come back. Yeah, ethics is a little bit of a nightmare with these kind of projects. I think as, just talk to your ethics board quite early about mm. what it is you're going to do. Um, I think it's potentially easier if it's a, um, a kind of contributory citizen science project. So you know what you're going to do. You know you're going to collect the data. Um, the tricky bit, which is I've remembered my point now um is around the risk of harm from these kind of projects because i do think there's a real risk of psychological harm through participating in air pollution projects people can be quite happily going around their everyday lives not thinking about air pollution at all and so i think raising awareness of that hang on you know you're in a very polluted area for that pollutant or whatever and especially if it's something like busy roads which they as an individual might not be able to do anything about. I mean, particularly if they're, um, like we know many, many people in the UK are living in poverty, not actually having a car, you're already doing public transport, you're already walking in there everywhere. There's not much you can do about being situated next to a busy road. So thinking about mechanisms of support for those people, um, resources that you can provide them with, um, perhaps access to counselling services, those kind of things. Um, yeah, to empower them rather than scare them off, yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I think that can be really problematic. Mm -hmm. A question from Tim um, about the quality of data that your mm. participants might um, collect for you. Yeah, um, Tim, are you thinking specifically about air quality projects? I guess, probably. Um, yeah, so um, I think it's important to do uh, so training is really important. So kind of doing pilot runs with participants um, so that they know about the quality, like how to actually use the monitors that you're going to be working with. Um, I think, um, yeah, air quality monitoring. Yeah, so I think firstly, 
make sure you've got a decent monitor to begin with. And, you know, the, the good ones are coming down in price um, or have been coming down in price. Um, so check the actual quality of the monitoring monitor, do lots of calibration um, at the beginning and calibration as close in time and spatially to the actual location where you're going to be doing the monitoring. Um, this is what we found within Tupamoe is obviously if you're trying to calibrate monitors in Stirling, that's a very different environment, particularly humidity wise, compared to the informal settlement that we're working in. So temporally and um, spatial calibration, uh, getting that right is good. Um, I think it's about training, basically. It's about supporting people, giving them resources, giving them easy to watch videos about how they're meant to do things, if they're required to do any calibration, if they're required to do any turning on or off um, to set the monitors up. I think we always kind of um, have an assumption that people will understand what it is we're talking about. And I think you know, providing video guidance. If people are happy and they don't want to watch that, that's absolutely fine. But providing that, I think, is quite important if you can. Um, so I think it's about training, really, um, is, yeah, is, is what I would suggest there. I mean, I think you can, for, for not non-air quality monitoring projects, we've done things in the past where we've done a little bit of a test, for example. So when people have submitted data um, for species, if we were doing, say, butterfly recording, we would do them a little test at the point when they submit their butterfly records. And we'd say, you know, what is this species? Is it A, B and C? And if they get those wrong, then we can maybe down weight their data in terms of the analysis. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah. Those are some methods I should I could think of. There are lots of papers um, out on this as well um, that you can have a have a look look for as well. I have another question about um, the sort of co-creation um, side of things, and with the this transdisciplinary working agreement you mentioned, that seems yeah. like a really good idea. And now you've mentioned it, it seems so obvious. Mm. But is it something that you do with other? citizen science projects since you've had success with that first agreement? Um, I don't think we, um, we have, but not in such a formal way. So we have a project at the moment called um, Youth Lives, which is um, led by the Centre for Reviews and Dissemination at the University of York. And that's working with youth who've got um, mental health experiences and bringing them into um, uh, evidence synthesis work. Um, and in that, we've kind of set out some ground rules at the beginning of the project was kind of like, you know, how we want to work together and how we want to treat each other. Um, but I think it's I think it's really useful for inter or transdisciplinary projects, actually. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just kind of like, here are some of the attributes that we like from individuals. Like, this is this is, this is is what we want to see. Um, this is the kind of ways of working that we want to set up. I think it's really valuable. Yeah, I used to work in geosciences and... Um... There was always issues on field trips when you're in a remote place in a small team and disagreements. Mm. I think this kind of thing would have been really useful in that situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Another question from Samuel Stump um, that's about if you use the citizen science approach to get information, otherwise hard to get. Mm. Um, so in an air quality setting, say recording behaviours or activities, have you got any examples of this? Yeah, so it, that's what we're going to be doing in Ingenious, which is this Bradford um, indoor air quality one. So we're going to be um, doing um, diaries in that. Um, so as well as doing measurements in people's homes, we're going to be getting them to fill in a diary along, along the way. Um, and we did that with... Um, so I mentioned that Makuru residents had come to SEI Africa and we did this little pilot study and we did that um, exact thing within there. So we did this kind of time activity di diary. So we asked people to tell us what they were doing at, I think it was half hour intervals. So um, we tried to make it as, um, as unonerous as possible. So we worked with them to decide what types of activities were going to be on that list. And then so it was kind of like commuting by uh, um, foot or commuting by a matatu, which is kind of like a little communal minibus thing, um, or cooking or um, sleeping, or I can't remember what the other ones were, but we gave a list. And so people had to just tick the box um, of what they were doing at each different time of day, um, which was really useful. Um, and also got information from them at that point about what they were actually cooking on as well, what fuel they were using for cooking. The problem you have, um, or you can have is um, social desirability bias um, with these kind of things. So unless you're actually observing people, 
they can sometimes lie <laughs> to you um, because they want, they want to be giving what's perceived as the right answer. So for example, um, on Tupamua, we had a project meeting last week and the numbers of people who were using charcoal, um, who were reporting to be using charcoal as the main fuel source in Makuru was much, much lower than any of the project team were expecting. So this is the UK team and the Kenyan team. And we suspect that people said that they were using kerosene because they perceived that to be a cleaner fuel than charcoal. So they didn't really want to admit that they were using charcoal on their stoves. Um, so it'll be quite interesting when we compare those activity diaries to the actual measurements coming out of people's homes. Because um, pollution, uh, the particular matter level is much higher in the informal settlement than in Buruburu. Um, which we think is partly to, to, do, to do with the stereotypes. Um, so yeah, so you can absolutely ask people, but you do need to bear in mind that sometimes they don't tell you quite the truth. <laughs> I think it was in, was it the Breathe London work um, that Frank Kelly is involved with? And they, whenever they saw an interesting spike in the data, they did a sort of backtrack mm. diary where without asking the participants, well, we saw a spike at 6 p.m. obviously dinner, they would say, what do you do at 6 p.m.? And they're sort of, mm. Kind of a retrospective diary mm. as well. Just yeah, like I think that's a really good idea. And I think that's something that we might try to incorporate in SAMI as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it might be because we'll be able to kind of notify people in the app to do little activities. And so it might well be that if we see certain spikes, we can say mm -hmm. what happens at this time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Whether they'd be able to remember or not is another question, isn't it? <laughs> Well, there's no more questions in the chat um, and I've asked some of mine, but thank you very much for joining us today, Sarah. That was really interesting. Um, oh, thanks for having me. These uh, seminars, so they'll be available on our YouTube channel um, for anyone who missed it. Um, and yeah, so we'll have another seminar in two weeks time. Uh, I can't remember the title of it now, but it'll be available on, uh, it'll be advertised on Twitter and via email and things. So keep your eyes open. Um, and thank you again, Sarah. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.